Hello, my name is Reza Ganjavi and I have the pleasure of being here with Mr. Navin Doshi and Dr. Chris Chappell. I do uh, still get involved in the markets and invest uh, investments, markets in real estate. Mm -hmm. I'm involved in there and then uh, I certainly do some philanthropic work. Mm -hmm. uh, I write articles on uh, mostly they are all posted on the Alanda website. Chapel um, is a professor of religious studies, is that correct? Mm, theological studies. Theological studies. Is there a difference? A little bit of a difference, okay. yeah. Okay. At Loyola Marymount. Can you tell us what, what that is actually, theological studies? Okay, studies. theological studies is a discipline where we're very interested in the meaning of texts. And of course, we study the history, we study the languages that are part of the development of religious literature, and we're also very involved with the communities for whom this literature is sacred, and the ways that these uh, texts are used in, in ritual, mm -hmm. as well as their ethical implications and their implications for everyday life. So in a, a theologically oriented department, there will generally be connection, live connection, with <coughs> faith communities. Okay. Is this uh, particularly around Christian literature or other religions as well? Well, our department is one of the largest, certainly in the western part of the United States. So we have over 20 faculty who specialize mm -hmm. in really all aspects of theology. So yes, we have uh, Catholic theologians, we have biblical scholars, we have ethicists who are trained primarily in, in the Western idiom of doing ethics, but we also have uh, two specialists in Hindu studies. Myself, I do Hindu and Buddhist and Jain traditions. Mm -hmm. We have a specialist in Islam. We have a specialist in Buddhism. We have a specialist in Judaism as well. And by specialist, I mean that we've been trained in the original source languages, that wow. we read sacred literature in the original, and we're, as I said before, in connection with these various communities. Fascinating. Um, uh, so, earlier you mentioned that Zoroaster was possibly influenced by the Upanishads. Hence, in some ways, right. because the, the Western religions are younger than the Eastern yes. religions. Mm -hmm. yes. So, yeah, the sacred text, the Zend Avesta, is written in a language very, very, very close to the Sanskrit language. And one of the interesting aspects of this text is that in the Indian traditions, the devas are the divine ones, mm -hmm. and the asuras are the ones that you need to watch out for. Mm -hmm. But in the Zendavesta, Ahura Mazda, of course, is, is the great wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, and asura and ahura are really the same word, and the word demon in Western traditions and similar word in, in Persian traditions is mm -hmm. the negative. So I think there was probably a little bit of competition between the Iranians and the Indians mm -hmm. 2,000, 3,000 years ago. So. Mm -hmm. But then Zoroaster actually influenced the subsequent religions of Judaism and Absolutely. Uh, Christianity yeah. and Islam. Because yeah. their fundamental beliefs are more or less very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that really opened my eyes when I came to the U.S. and went to university and studied comparative religions mm -hmm. was how similar they are to, to each other. And meanwhile, mm -hmm. all the members, they think, oh, my way is so different and so much better. <laughs> but once you actually yeah. study the other guy's way as well, you see, wow, it's essentially, it's, it's very similar. Yeah. Yeah. I have one comment here. Uh, we don't realize, we think that because we have planes and autos, we are more interconnected. But even in those days, 2,000, 3,000 years back, they were pretty much connected at a slow rate mm -hmm. on the horsebacks or camels or even plane walking. But they were connected and there was 
exchange of ideas and philosophies. One of the biggest issues that we face today in our world is fanaticism. Rupert Sheldrake argues that this is a 20th century, 21st century phenomenon. Um, and at least extremism, he says, it's something which is a new thing, is not so old. I, I somewhat agree with him, although suppression, fanaticism, dogma has been around for centuries. Mm -hmm. But now it's become extreme to the point of, you know... I agree. I do agree with that. Polarization, greater polarization. Which is economically influenced, as you in pointed economy, out in your book. Yes, yes, yes. So the, the, uh, it's, it's still, we still have influence of colonies mm -hmm. and materialism and power, hunger for, I mean, greed and power. Bridge building, as you say in your book, for example, the more there is communication, the more understanding of others, the, the, the more prone we are to not be fanatics. You know. Mm. You know, so education is a big key. Where, where it comes from, change. bridge building? Bridge building has come from a very simple message when you really think about it. The middle path of Buddha, mm -hmm. middle path between the two extremes mm -hmm. is yeah. a middle path. But there is a corollary out of that. Mm -hmm. And that is bring the two opposites in balance and harmony okay. and let that complement to go beyond. And that brings bridge building. One of the things you said in your book, which was very interesting, was that I think you were, uh, I forgot which author you were referring to, but that uh, you said that the greatest contribution of India to human civilization is psychology. True. I find this to be very fascinating and very true, actually, uh, because some of the greatest teachers that came out of that place were really psychologists, you know, like take the modern teacher Krishnamurti, for example. To me, Krishnamurti is all about psychology. psychology. You are absolutely right. These are not my words. Easton Smith uh, gives credit to three great civilizations. Mm -hmm. Western civilization discovering and learning more about nature. Chinese civilization more about sociology. And he says India's greatest contribution is in the field of psychology. And not only he, but also Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, yeah. Myth, myth, mythic stories is nothing else but psychology. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very interesting because from one angle, we can say that every path is okay, is good, as long as it works. Hmm. I cannot tell you or somebody else that, you know, your way is different than my way, it's wrong. It, at least in my opinion, if it works for you, then it's okay. Hmm. Uh, now, on the other hand, it seems that even people who are practicing a certain religion uh, and it works for them, still from a psychological standpoint, although it provides some alleviations to modern day challenges and so on, but still there is an element of suffering, at least this is my observation from people that I know mm -hmm. of various faiths. Uh, so without this deep understanding of the psychology, let's say, of the psyche, of the workings of the psyche, uh, I think a religion by itself may not be sufficient for providing a full human. Psychology is very, very important. In a religious um, context, um, I wonder how much of the religious beliefs that people have is actually experiential in terms of something which is tangible and not just a set of beliefs. In terms of, because if you look at some of the traditions, like you mentioned the Sufism, for example, or uh, in the Chinese uh, background, they have similar things, where they talk about this other state of being or this other movement than the normal uh, everyday engagement of thinking all the time and the busyness that we're engaged in. But this other state is a very real thing which you actually experience, mm -hmm. or, or there is experiencing of it. I don't want to say you experience, because then it gets technical about who is the you, because psychologically the you has to end in order for that state to be. Mm -hmm. Because at least, it might, I don't know if that makes sense, because the you, the self, the psychological self, is a bunch of memories usually, mm -hmm. which is limited, because memories are limited. Right.
and that this other movement is a is unlimited mm -hmm. uh, even I think the Bible refers to God as love mm -hmm. uh, and there's other writers who, who, who talk about this other movement being love and I think something we can actually experience right um, yeah the William James who wrote over a hundred years ago put forward a book uh, the varieties of religious experience mm -hmm. and he examines all different avenues <coughs> where people make that connection and his analysis is, is really quite psychological and that he documents in case after case after case how there has to be a willingness to go into a place of darkness, to go into a place of very profound questioning in order to emerge into what so many traditions call the light. Mm -hmm. And that book really sets out um, the American approach to what is called pragmatism. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, clear in this, in this book and the many books that followed it is that experience is required, that it's not simply a recitation of a belief that someone right. tells you, but there has to be some transformation within the individual I, person. I believe experience is the thing. It is exper experience, I believe, you cannot logically explain. Mm -hmm. When you experience divine Presence. something beyond, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's an experience. Right. Now, uh, I don't know if that fits uh, the, you know, uh, 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 your question that I'm about to answer. The two, two uh, shall I say, saintly or realized people, one of them uh, was Ram Krishna, uh, guru of uh, Vivekananda, I believe. Mm -hmm. he, he practiced every religion, I believe, mm -hmm. he did. to understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. So did Houston Smith. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there, there's been many attempts in the past where they bring a uh, a expert in Islam, an uh, expert in Christianity and uh, Judaism, so sit side by side. Just try to find the uh, harmony. <laughs> it just doesn't seem to work. Because as long as a person is, it, and this seems to be the nature of identification and belief, when you identify yourself with a belief, then you automatically get opposed to anybody else who doesn't have that belief. Whereas people like Dr. Sheldrake, who is a Christian, Mm -hmm. When I discuss with him some of the fundamental Christian beliefs, like mm -hmm. you can only go through to God through Jesus, and his interpretation of that is very broad and liberal and right. It depends peaceful. upon um, what we call Christology, and Christology is the vision of the presence of Christ, and the presence of Christ in various theologies would be all inclusive, so mm -hmm. that what. Um, one Catholic theologian, Karl Rahner, said is, could be offensive slightly, but he says that really every good soul is an anonymous Christian, and that anybody who abides by the suggestion that we live in forgiveness and the suggestion that we really work at cultivating righteousness, and there can be people of that sort found in all faiths, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. of course they're participating exactly. in the vision of Christ. I just gave an example a few minutes back of Sant Kabir, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. two different religions, but he built a bridge. So that's one way to resolve this yes. conflict. I think it's the yeah, understanding has a big role. When I first came to the U.S., um, I, the, the reaction I was hearing from people when they word, heard the word Allah, uh -huh. the, which is the Arabic word for God, as far as I'm concerned, right. then th their interpretation was that this is a God called Allah. Right. But when I grew up, when I heard the word Allah, Allah means God. Yeah. So it's the same God which is the Christian God. And the of course, you know? yeah. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me recite <clears throat> what Mahatma Gandhi used to in his prayers. Mm -hmm. He would recite this verses. Raghupati Raghava Rajaram 
पतित पावन स्थान ईश्वर अल्लाह तेरे नाम सबको सन्मत दिदे भगवान सो देर आर टू नेम्स फॉर हिंदूज एंड मुस्लिम्स अगेन and he included both he included both and it's so interesting in india because every morning you hear the call to prayer and every morning you hear all of the the hindu chants right. and just the whole atmosphere is so charged with all manner of religious practice and uh, one of the other things that's uh, happened throughout the history is a corruption of religious organizations mm Uh, or distortion, let's say, as sure. a milder world. world. Empire building. <laughs> <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They just built a gazebo, yoga gazebo at the Krishna Murti <laughs> Foundation. <laughs> It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, this is a very interesting subject, and, and we have some contemporary examples of it, like in the case of distortions and interpretations and so on what's happening with the Christian Way Foundation America I I wouldn't call it corruption that would be too big of a yeah, word it, that's a corporate But, influence mm -hmm. you uh, in the old time of course Christian or Catholic church built an empire shall I say But in modern time they all want to build up uh, you know walls around them they want to box it so that they can keep their audience within their walls Yeah, but the problem is the audience is so small in this case, yeah, yeah. and the supporters are so few. So the, the, the issues that there are is one is caring for the land, which Christian Murray was very heavy on. I just took, a, uploaded some pictures about the oak grove from the oak grove where he spoke for decades. There's broken beer bottles, trash, cigarettes, <laughs> horrible. Then there's the caring for the teachings, which there are this, mm. there's, they're not really doing it all the time because they have speakers who come and. to say everything within the course of an hour which Krishna Murray discarded for a whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like ideas of the higher self and lower self and all these things. And then um, there is also dilution, because Krishna Murray made it very clear to a couple of people I personally know to not, not mix him with other things, mm -hmm. but now they're having Vedic chants and yoga and this and that, which is okay, yoga there is not a problem, but when you advertise it as such as they had in the past, then It's a little bit of a dilution, in my opinion. Yeah. And the last one is relationships with, with the community, with people, and so on. Because I keep running into people who are alienated by this group. So, how many in, in marketing they know that it, it costs a lot less to keep an existing customer than to get a new one. So when the audience is not that broad, then some of the closest friends to Krishna already don't want to have anything to do with all this organization. Now, the history of it is that Krishna Murti Foundation in India. K himself wanted to dissolve it because he was he he saw this coming mm -hmm. and he's he he's very much against spiritual organizations, but then they talked him into it. They said, you know, we need something, right. and right. Uh, but it's a real a real pity to see it. Shyamali himself, he was a giant mm -hmm. you know, in terms of insights into some of the things that you just mentioned. For yes, yes, yeah, certainly just incredible insights. You know, he let go so much of. Uh, what shall I say? The donations. But, you know, one, uh, he saw, you're right, he saw uh, that these guys are trying to build an empire, so to speak. Theosophic society actually bought the land where we have this Hollywood bowl mm -hmm. for Krishnamurti to address some thousands of people. Mm -hmm. He didn't like it. <laughs> well, he gave back castle yeah. in, 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 in Netherlands, and so he gave back everything when he dissolved the Order of Big Star mm -hmm. of the East. Right. He re right. regretted it later, yeah. I think. He said, oh, I should have <laughs> kept that one castle. <laughs> it could have turned it into a school. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but I watched a documentary from some Buddhist monks in the Himalayas, deep into it. You have to hide for days to get to them with permission. They spend days in, in, in these boxes, basically, mm -hmm. to meditate. And you know, the shocking thing I heard was that they said the hardest thing in life is controlling your mind. That's right. And these guys are doing it 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So that made me think, maybe there's... And then, you know, I read Krishnamurti talking about things like the controller is the control. Mm -hmm. And that it, control is kind of out of the picture. Because when mm -hmm. you're attentive, then there is no controller as a separate entity, you know? Right. And yeah, it's quite control means... of the senses. Mm -hmm. 
See, I think he, his emphasis, which is, in my humble opinion, it's, it's pretty accurate. We're all conditioned. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who, who the person is. Even, you know, the person who is very humble, etc., you know, at, at a closer, but there is some conditioning. And it's very difficult to get rid of that conditioning. Absolutely. I mean, at least in the animalistic level. <laughs> Did you want to say something? Thinking of uh, Krishnamurti's journals. Right. And one of the disciplines that he used in his writing was to refrain from using the word I. Mm -hmm. And one. he describes, yeah, he puts his observations in the third person, but even more significantly, he's placed emphasis on that which is seen and tries to do away with the filter. So he mm -hmm. attempts to become a pure phenomenologist and really describing things as they are. Mm -hmm. and it's beautiful to read. Yes, absolutely. Also commentaries on living, uh, which are three series, mm -hmm. and each one starts with the description of whether it's in nature, natural scenery, or he was in the city he was watching. Right. He takes a very ordinary scene and describes it so beautifully, mm -hmm. in such detail, which reminded me of Confucius. He said, uh, you know, an extraordinary person finds the, the, the extraordinary in the ordinary. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. But it's always that presence of, well, in his word, this otherness is mm -hmm. one of the words he uses mm -hmm. often to describe that thing, which is a very real experience, experience is that the right exactly, word? Exactly, yes. But then he, he actually talks about removing those things which are not that. It's like mm -hmm. a, a negative approach versus positive, you know. What is love? Well, maybe we can't define love, but we can look at what is not love, like jealousy and so on. Right, right. And the activity of thought, which is limited itself, therefore you're caught in the realm of thinking. So Rumi says, come out of the realm of time, and join the realm of love. Mm -hmm. Because thought is usually on, in the realm of time, right? You usually exactly. think about either the past mm -hmm. or projecting the past into the future. Mm -hmm. There is also, uh, I believe, uh, the fact that we are talking, I mean, it's mysterious. My answer to that, the fact that we are able to communicate, the fact that the creativity comes just spontaneously in our minds, is quantum connection to the Brahman, the all-pervading, call the Brahman, morphic field, whatever you want to call. But there is something there, I mean, beyond nature, beyond space, time, energy, matter. It just makes sense that the three of us are part of one, some yeah. oneness. Yes, yes, yes. 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 And there is some resonance in that, in our dialogue. Resonance implies understanding, receiving, not just transmitting, but receiving too. And the psychological self, one of its characteristics is isolation. So it, because just by definition, because it's limited. Whenever you have limitation, you have division. So it's divided from the rest. So it has its own problems, it has its own separations, isolations, and so on. So, so death, psychological death, is very important. Right? Mm. And I think many scriptures have talked about mm. this. Dying moment to moment, dying day by day. Right, right. So the, the Mr. Doshi, I was wondering about uh, your organization, the Nalanda. Is this mainly a, a, a philanthropic? Yes, it is mainly philanthropic, educational. Mm -hmm. He's also a director, oh. one of the directors. Great. Uh, Maintains a very good website, and yes. Mr. Doshi writes very prescient reflections on um, the economic state of the world, mm -hmm. and he has some very interesting ideas that people can consult. Some people like to go there to get some good investment advice also. Well, yeah, I mean, not all the time, but... <laughs> and then there's uh, philosophical essays there. Right, and right. then there's various books that are, are published by Nalanda and it's okay. international. It, I think it boils down to bridge building, meaning, you know, bringing the balance, whether it is in economics, 
any endeavor, I think chapter five in that book, if mm -hmm. you had read, mm -hmm. it uh, basically we, uh, our, our faculty, our equipment is connected in almost every endeavor that every human beings have, you know. So it, it tries to connect, let's say, to the politics, to economics, mm -hmm. on and on and on. So yeah, I like the fact this started about spirituality and psychology and went on into investment ideas. <laughs> it's all related, right? Yeah. Very much. I love this line here. I believe every one of us should spend more of our lives bridging the gaps between people of different views and cultures. This mm -hmm. is very key. The only way to unify such a diverse nature is through the process of transcendence that could bring the experience of unity by becoming selfless. Right. Selfless implies there is no ego and no mental mass. Right. Therefore, no inertia analogous to transformation of a subatomic atomic particle to an ever-expanding wave with infinite agility. So, the mental mass, this is content, right? Yeah, I mean, don't we say that he has a mental inertia. Mm -hmm. Inertia implies mass. Mm -hmm. mm. Right? Yeah. K defines meditation as the emptying of consciousness of its content. Exactly. So this process of emptying is very mm -hmm. important. Not because he says it, he's just right, a pointer. Right, right, right. But right. I think this is when I read mental mass, same thing. <laughs> yeah, that there's a heaviness, a weightiness, a, mm -hmm. what we might call a tomasic nature to right. it, and you have to release yeah. it. Conditioning is outcome of mental mass. When the mind yeah, gets, yeah. you know, it's... Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I'm thinking in terms of samskara, toward the end of the Bhagavad Gita, they talk about the three great qualities that I think are part of samskara. The gunas. No, these are three that can be assessed through the three gunas. Uh -huh. But the first is yajna. And yajna is the activity of working and thinking and reflecting and putting all the pieces together of what is needed in order to create a particular world. And for some people, now we go to the gunas, that could be um, a negative tamasic world, mm -hmm. it could be a world driven by passion, and most optimally it's driven by lightness and illumination. Mm -hmm. Now the second is tapas. And tapas is a commitment on the part of the individual to adhere to what um, Naveen has just said, to adhere in various ways through training to be able to restrain the senses. So for some people it could be tapas and being very, very careful about what one says. For some people it could be tapas being very careful about what one eats. For others, it could be tapas in terms of um, physical exertion, of mm -hmm. actually putting the body in a place either through meditation or through yoga asana, where there's a creative heat generated that serves that purifying function. Some people use their tapas to gain a particular goal, and that would be tamasic. Some people use their tapas to just create wonderful things within the world, and, and that's, that's fine from operating within uh, the realm of passion. And then, of course, the best tapas is to bring one to that place of quiet meditation. And then the third great samskara that can be taught is really the art of giving. And dana is the um, third real gift of Indian civilization to the world and that there's an emphasis on always being of service to others. Another word for this might be seva, but some people give so that they can get something in return. Other people give to aggrandize their own situation, but the greatest gift is a gift that's given out of that place of, of total selflessness. And those three samskaras can be taught. And I remember as, as our children were growing up, we would um, gather around on Sunday night and light a flame and just talk. And we'd sit and be quiet, and then we would talk about nonviolence, and we would talk about satya, which is truth, and we would talk about mm -hmm. how it's really important not to take something that doesn't belong to you, and uh, really sort of inculcate the values that my wife and I hold very dear, 
but it was a, a period of um, some scara education mm -hmm. where they you know they were invited and emplaced within this reflective moment that as children who knows if they'll remember it specifically no, but, but it's it, important it at least they hear it because we're exactly. in a moral chaos yeah yeah in terms of satya truth <laughs> truthfulness oh, yeah. hollywood yeah. next door here yeah. it promotes yeah. lying it's in some of, cases yeah. because of conditioning the the thickest conditioning in today's yeah. time very good observation of rupert shabrik uh, is polarization because of conditioning. So when you talk to a democrat, ardent, they'll say always ardent democrat, they will not find any flaws or faults in any other democrat. True also for Republicans. Something similar also in, in the field of economics. The Keynesians will always remain Keynesians. It's an identification too. Yeah. 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 It's a combination. I mean, you, you show them, hey, yeah, this, there is a fault right here, crystal clear, but they will not accept it, mm -hmm. conditioning. Mm -hmm. now, in true. terms of, Chris, as you were talking about this uh, end of Bhagavad Gita, which was very interesting for me to hear, I didn't know this, I remembered um, Kay talking about the importance of understanding what is. In fact, uh, he says that if you, or he points out, he suggests, mm. that if you understand what you are or what is, without trying to change it, then that very seeing, that very understanding is action. Mm -hmm. Insight is action mm -hmm. and can, change, can bring about change. Absolutely. This is a phenomenal in terms of psychology, therapy and so on. Mm -hmm. People struggle so much with trying to become something they're not. Mm -hmm. If you're angry, you try to become non-angry. And uh, many therapists don't help because they don't have this insight. Mm -hmm. But first you have to really become in touch with what you are. Right. Because if you don't, if you try to be not angry, you're actually moving away from what is. And you're right. not understanding what is, therefore you're for, uh, forever slave of what you are because you don't see it. Right. Well, there has to, of course, be the transcendence of anger. But in order for that to happen, there has to be a willingness, as William James said, to go into that dark place and really ferret out what causes this anger. But I think it's important also um, to both acknowledge psychotherapy and to hold it a little bit under suspicion if a psychotherapeutic process becomes a constant rehashing of resentment, it could only serve perhaps exactly. to rebuild the resentment. <coughs> so there needs to be some sort of cathartic moment. There needs to be some sort of transformation. And uh, a regular meditative practice can provide that. Surely. It depends on the therapist. There are many good therapists. Then there are other therapists who use that perpetuative process yeah. to continue their business. Sure. <laughs> because sure. as long as you're confused, you need sure. a therapist. Right, right, right. <laughs> but this lack of division is very important. Mm -hmm. Kay talked with Dr. David Bohm, as you know. Right. And when they went into this deeply, that about the observer and the observed being the same. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is very important. It, it originated with Tagore. Mm -hmm. Tagore and Einstein. I have recited that in this book. I don't know if you... Yeah, I, I noticed it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was in, I think, 1920 or 30 or that, thereabout, when they were together. Mm -hmm. And even is, before that, yeah. Patanjali describes oh, okay. that state okay. of okay. samadhi okay. Okay. where yeah. there, the mm -hmm. distinction right. between subject and object dissolves and it's just mm -hmm. the state of pure clarity. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is where Krishnamurti took people in his writings and his lectures. I think uh, in everyday life, it doesn't even have to life, be. Yeah. Know, one of the uh, most popular hundred books in 20th century is supposed to be a book written by Thomas Kuhn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know that. I know uh, that book. I had to read it my very first year of college. The, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Okay. And it's about paradigms. Okay. And when the paradigm shifted from classical physics to modern physics, all of a sudden the notion of a fixed materiality dissolved mm -hmm. as we came to understand through the Heisenberg principle that our 
perception of a thing affects a thing, and that our thoughts are participants in the constructed realities that we inhabit. Exactly, exactly. I think, yeah, basically, even science, scientists also have biases. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing. They're also thing. fanatic as our yeah, friend can be, of course, can be, can be. Yeah. yeah, but see, in many, in minds of many people, they don't think scientists having a bias. And that's a problem. Well, Rupert Sheldrake in his book, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Science Set Free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Brings he brings up this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see if there's anything else. Spontaneous love. You were talking about that's that. That's also part of creativity, uh, Razor. Mm -hmm. Love. Any, anything spontaneous, mm -hmm. you have a quantum connection or a morphic connection, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. Lao Tzu in Tao Te Ching, somewhere he says something to the effect that the essence of Tao is spontaneity. Yes, yes. This is fascinating, wonderful. Mm. And love is, the, I, I love the way you connected those in your book about love and spontaneity spontaneous love because love is always fresh it's always mm. spontaneous I think that's a good place to end okay <laughs> good good thank you very yeah, much yeah uh, I, I hope we answer both of us answer the right questions thank you that's great thank you now, so tell me more tell us more about you now yeah well uh, what can I say I have a very simple story I was born in Iran uh -huh. moved to New York Finished high school there. Which high school? Uh, Ithaca. I went to Ithaca High School. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm from upstate New York. Oh, you are? Yeah, yeah, from yeah. where? Yeah, huh? Okay. Which is near Geneseo. Okay. Yeah. And then I moved to California and went to college, <laughs> studied computer science, philosophy, and I have an MBA also. Gosh. <laughs> Did you go to Santa Barbara? Or? No, I got my MBA from Irvine. I was in Orange County.